Brett, if I could ask you to uh, answer the, the question regarding limitations on freedom of expression in the context of uh, not just this resolution, but in, in the context of um, how the OIC has participated in the United Nations in general, at the Human Rights Council. I mean. um, <clears throat> let me just uh, state, um, again, I'm not Stephen Groves. I'll take this down now that uh, the speaker has gotten over to me. I'm Brett Schaefer, and I don't want any uh, potential remarks that he may not agree with to be attributed to him by mistake. Um, let me just first talk about the, the beginning, and I guess my fundamental um, thought about this question about whether there should be limitations on freedom of expression and freedom of speech is what is the purpose of having a right to freedom of expression or freedom of speech, and that is, uh, is it to uh, protect uh, people, people's rights to say bland and inoffensive things, and I would argue probably not. If something you say is bland or inoffensive, there's chances, there's few chances anybody's going to try and stop you from saying it. So really the whole concept of freedom of expression, freedom of speech is meant to protect the right of individuals to actually say uh, disturbing, possibly offensive, or at the very least um, uh, 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 issues subject to some debate and uh, disagreement. And so when you take that into account, the question is how far um, does that right go? Does that protection extend to? And I would argue, at least based on my experience in the United States, which has a very uh, expansive view at this point, uh, that, that that line has to be very far. Because when you take into account who is potentially the, uh, the target of this type of objectionable or disagreeable or debatable speech, almost inevitably it's somebody powerful. It's, some, it's either somebody in the government it's somebody in some sort of powerful institution. In this case, we're talking about um, a religion or religious figures. And those that are saying objectionable or disagreeable or um, uh, debatable points about these uh, powerful figures need the protection that a freedom of expression or freedom of uh, speech right provides them to uh, sort of engage in, in the, uh, the marketplace of ideas, which leads to hopefully a more um, uh, insightful analysis of various uh, uh, ideas that are, are put on the table and hopefully a more pluralistic and, uh, and healthy society in general. And so uh, from my perspective, when you have uh, blasphemy or sacrilegious statements or uh, cartoons in the, in the Danish context, um, that for better or for worse, you need to have these, these types of, uh, of expression uh, protected. Otherwise, what's the point in having freedom of expression in the first place. When, as far as the OIC uh, in the Human Rights Council, this is uh, the practice of the OIC and the practice of some states in the Human Rights Council as far as the freedom of expression belies their, their overt or their stated uh, commitment to that right. Because when you look at NGOs that come before the council to try and, you know, uh, reveal or talk about various incidents of oppression, various incidents of human rights abuses in the council, repeatedly you see not only the OIC, but um, often a member of the OIC, uh, issue points of objection, interrupted the NGO testimony repeatedly with the sole purpose of trying to intimidate the speaker and to try and discourage future repetition of these types of confrontations or revelations of what is actually occurring on the ground. And so the practice of the OIC in the form of the Human Rights Council is one that is uh, discouraging freedom of expression, freedom of speech, discouraging uh, investigation into these very troublesome situations, and it's something that should be taken in context when you hear them talk about their effort to try and promote freedom uh, of expression and freedom of speech only to try and protect against defamation of religions. And I agree with the earlier speaker. The sole intent of this effort is simply to try and um, provide cover and justification for what are uh, excessive and onerous um, efforts domestically by many of these countries to try and uh, repress discussion of religion, practice of, re of religions other than the dominant religion, and, or discussions of, um, uh, of problems that are occurring or committed by that government in that country. Just leave it at that. Thank you.
So that, that actually leads nicely into my, my next question. Um, uh, Carolyn actually uh, was talking earlier about how even how freedom of speech is administered um, is nuanced between different European, European countries. Um, the greatest criticism of the defamation of religions concept has, has really been that it uh, protects ideas rather than individuals, which is contrary to almost every other human rights movement. Um, so uh, traditionally, to defame a person, um, you would need to say something that was untrue about the person, and there would be an inquiry in the court as to whether what you said was factually untrue. Um, but the idea of defaming religion would require the state to decide what's true or not true about a religion. Um, at the same time, um, I w was wondering whether actually Monsieur Gobert could uh, could address um, some of these questions and and uh, maybe Mr. Abrams as well. In in the United States, for example, we have um, you know one of the best known cases has has allowed uh, where the federal where, where um, the United States courts allowed Nazis, um, despite uh, how abhorrent most people find their ideology to be, to march through. Peoria and have a, a Peoria, Illinois, and have a Skokie, Illinois. I'm sorry, and have a um, have a, a public demonstration. Uh, whereas in Europe, there are um, more stringent hate speech laws, and in some countries, even. Um, uh, Holocaust denial laws that control what you can and cannot say about the Holocaust. So I'll play the devil's advocate and ask sort of the difficult governance question again of where you draw the where you draw the line and how it is different um, to control that kind of speech regarding the Holocaust or um, what constitutes incitement to hatred as opposed to just vehement opposition to somebody's idea um, or even somebody's lifestyle um, as opposed to uh, defamation of religion in in, in this particular context. So, Monsieur Gobert and, and Abrams, but perhaps the other panelists have something to say as well. First of all, every time a law needs to be drawn up, it's a kind of negation of dialogue because the dialogue was not possible and things went too far. In France, for example, the so-called Gesso law, which uh, is against the negation of the, the Holocaust, it took years to draw it up because things went too far and at some point things one had to say stop. In Europe, for example, in the European Parliament, we had legislation against uh, the, to ensure a fight against discrimination. Should there be the need to drop law, laws which prevent um, discrimination? Well, unfortunately, there are men and women who are undergoing such terrible pressure in their lives because of discrimination that one has to drop legislation. In the United States, there are things which can be said which cannot be said in our country, and sometimes documents come from the United States. Sometimes these documents are quite uh, sensitive, and there's nothing you can do about them because we can't really accept them. Uh, the the uh, League um, Against uh, uh, Racism and Anti-Semitism in France tried to take Yahoo to court, but it wasn't possible. Um, laws against uh, Nazi ideology, those laws are also quite difficult in Europe. For example, we go quite far in uh, limiting, not limiting things, but when, it th when matters go too far, then we try to legislate. Start with, with a comment on uh, some of the words that we've been using because they're used in this area. Uh, I don't think we have an Islamophobia problem. We have a free speech phobia problem. 